Hello everyone, this is Rebecca Salauda from Tosa Together. Welcome to Tosa Talks, building a diverse, thriving community, an ongoing Facebook Live, or not so live today, I guess, series, proudly sponsored by our generous friends at Bostic. Tosa Talks features three monthly presentations designed to provide meaningful discussions around racial and social justice issues to support the work of building an inclusive anti-racist community. Tonight's presentation features a discussion with members of the Milwaukee City and County Task Force on Climate and Economic Equity. As always, your comments and questions are welcome. Please use the Facebook comment section to add your voice to the conversation, or I guess in this uh, uh, situation, if you want to um, make a comment to the chat and we will do our best to have those questions addressed. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's host, Catherine Reby. Thank you, Rebecca. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Our guests tonight are all members of the Milwaukee City County Task Force on Climate and Economic Equity. This task force was created in 2019 to develop a plan to address climate change and economic inequity in the city of Milwaukee. The goals of the plan are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40, 45% by 2030, create jobs in the new green market targeted to people of color and those with limited economic opportunity. Since the beginning of 2021, nine work groups have been meeting to develop initial recommendations. The work groups include Milwaukee County residents and representatives from environmental groups, local government, nonprofit organizations, and businesses. Each work group has developed recommendations for a specific sector, such as transportation, housing, renewable energy, or land use. For, not, for tonight's talk, we are excited to welcome our guests. Our guests. Celia Jackson is Chief of Staff at the Milwaukee City Attorney's Office. She serves on the Transportation Work Group of the Milwaukee City County Task Force on climate and equity. Welcome, Celia. Yeah. Jennifer Evans is the co-chair of the Education and Outreach Work Group and serves on the Transportation and Building Work Groups of the Task Force. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Rob Zimmerman is a member of the Wauwatosa Sustainability Committee and has lived in Wauwatosa for nearly, nearly 30 years. Rob participates in two work groups, the Waste Circular Economy Group and the Green Buildings Group. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, Catherine. So thank you all for coming and for watching, and we will start our presentation now. Thanks for that introduction, Catherine. <clears throat> and I'm, I appreciate the invitation to speak tonight. We, uh, I understand that we're going to be talking, that the focus of our talk is about um, climate in in our lives in in the uh, larger community and I'm aware of the fact that we have varying degrees of familiarity with uh, climate change some of you may even be experts in the field I'm not uh, but I'm willing to sh tell the story of my unfolding awareness maybe some of you can relate I retired a few years ago uh, my children are grown and I was really looking forward to having some time for personal projects that I've put up over the years but I also wanted to do something to be beneficial to my community. So I did some preliminary research and quickly determined that I need to learn more about climate change. I consider myself a, a fairly well-informed person. I listen to the news. I try to stay on top of important issues. But I was surprised to learn that scientists have been warning us for 30 years about the dangers of global warming. I learned that our use of fossil fuels to power vehicles, heat our homes and factories, uh, run our factories has been pumping out carbon dioxide and methane gases that have been building up in the atmosphere. I also learned about the massive destruction of natural areas that formerly had the capacity to capture some of these carbon emissions. I learned that all of this has led to the disrupt disruption of ecosystems upon which we depend for survival. How did I not know this? Um, why wasn't this headline news? 
Oh, you know what? I forgot to share my screen. <laughs> I will do that now. Sorry. I think um, I got a little discombobulated with all of our uh, um, technical difficulties. So, and if I do, if I, uh, I do that again, let me know. <laughs> so this was the first slide, just giving an overview of uh, the whole issue of climate change. So maybe you've seen this slide. It's, it's, uh, it's alarm the information on it is alarming, but you know, it's still kind of an abstraction in a way. What really hit home for me when was I learned that more than a fifth of all the people in the world are already living in regions that are seeing uh, warming greater than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And according to the vulner Climate Vulnerability Report, our current level of warming are currently creating millions of climate refugees and killing more than 400,000 people a year. I also learned that climate change is inextricably linked to social justice and racial inequity. Many of us have become more aware of how our economy has generated wealth for a few while leaving others behind. But I learned how much of our econ economic system is based on the extraction and use of fossil fuels, much of it taken from indigenous lands. I learned from multiple sources that people of color have been systematically disadvantaged They've been exposed to higher levels of pollution and seen fewer investments in community infrastructure, such as clean water and housing, making them more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Across the globe and here in Wisconsin, those who contributed the least to climate change will suffer the most from its effects. So here we are with a dual problem of addressing climate and equity. I recently read, recently, blah, recently read a letter to world leaders from a mother in the Amazon rainforest. She described the massive destruction of her world by Western oil companies. Her message, your civilization is killing life on earth. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres summed up the results of the most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change by saying that this is, quote, a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at re immediate risk. Global heating is affecting every region of the earth. The handwriting is on the wall. Scientists agree that to avoid climate disaster, and irreversible damage to our planet, we must reduce global greenhouse emissions by 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. That only gives us eight years to meet that first benchmark. It's taken a long time for many of us to accept this reality, but we are at a tipping point in public awareness. The fires in California, and heat waves across the nation have forced us to reckon with the situation. A recent EL study indicates that 70% of Americans now accept the reality of climate change. However, many of us still see climate change as something that is far off in the future or only affects other parts of the country. Less than 50% of us are concerned that it will affect us personally. So let's take just a minute to look at some local impacts and what it means for us. Some of the changes are really subtle and easy to miss unless you take the long view. Every 10 years, NOAA releases a 30 year climate averages report. Those new averages show that Wisconsin average annual temperature was 1.4 degrees warmer than the previous 30 year average. This has led to changes in our seasonal weather patterns, which are illustrated here in this map by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If you're a gardener like me, you probably notice some of these changes. Even if we do notice the changes, we don't always make the connection between weather and climate change. 
For example, extreme precipitation events have become particularly more common in the Midwest. And you can see that dark blue section um, saying that they are up 37%. These heavy rainfalls have resulted in flooding, particularly for low-lying areas where underserved families live. Repeated flooding over the last 12 years along the 30th Street corridor, for example, has caused $32 million in damages to homes and businesses. This photo is from the newscast of the flood on Capitol and 35th Street just two years ago. In Wauwatosa, floods in 1997 and 98 wiped out the neighborhood east of Hart Park. If you have had any flooding in your home, you know that it could threaten your health and safety. For example, Floods can lead to um, sewage overflows, which contaminate our drinking water. And flooded homes can develop mold and mildew that can make us sick. The more obvious effect of climate change in our area is the increase in heat and, and droughts. Heat kills more people in the US every year than any other natural disaster, so it's very dangerous. Although the Midwest is not one of the hottest areas in the nation, the pace of rising temperatures is shifting faster than in other regions. While heat waves may pose an inconvenience for some people, it can be deadly for others. Heat waves can affect the health of the community in ways that many of us may not be aware of. For example, it can trap polluted air, um, creating smog and ozone that impacts people with asthma and other chronic health conditions. Lately, we have seen farm production and the dairy industry affected by heat waves. I was surprised to learn that heat waves can actually make streets buckle and create rolling blackouts due to high energy demands. Urban areas are particularly vulnerable. If you live in a neighborhood with a large tree canopy, you're somewhat protected. But areas with limited green spaces and lots of heat absorbing paved surfaces experience much higher temperatures. These impacts are experienced to a greater degree by low-income households. I read a study by the New York, in the New York Times, which found a direct correlation between formerly redlined communities and the presence of heat islands, where temperatures can be up to seven degrees higher than surrounding areas. These results were corroborated locally by the Wisconsin Department of Health. This map, that I have up now shows that households in low income and minority neighborhoods are particularly vulnerable to the effects of heat waves. We can see that Wauwatosa is not immune, but those living in the center of Milwaukee are most at risk. Today, the health and safety of many families is determined by their zip code. I'm gonna turn this over to Celia who can help us understand, better understand the relationship between climate and equity. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Celia Jackson, and I'm here to talk a little bit about um, some of the inequities that we see in climate and some of the other infrastructure. So what you have here on the screen is just talking about some of the medical and physical health that, um, that disparities that exist. Changes in fitness and activity level, um, as Jennifer has already mentioned, heat-related illnesses, allergies, increased exposure to waterborne and vector-borne illness. Now we know that um, climate change is gonna have an impact on our health. We've seen it in so many instances just from some of the earlier slides with the water and, and all of the damage that can happen in flooded areas, as well as the fires that have happened out west. But there are all other kind of factors that um, occur that impact our physical health that are directly related to climate. One of those also includes mental health, um, the stress, anxiety, depression, the sense of loss, and the strains on social relationships. You know, um, one of the ways that I got involved with the Transportation Mobility Group was work that I've done with respect to um, the reckless driving in the city of Milwaukee. Stress just by navigating the roads. And it does exist higher in some communities more so than others. 
Substance abuse, these post-traumatic st stress disorders are very real that impact the mental health of people who have so many things to have, they have to contend with. America, um, America is struggling because we have not taken health in some communities. Um, the, the whole notion of increased interpersonal aggression, the increase in violence and crime, social in instability, all of those factors contribute to um, an unhealthy society. And our climate certainly is a major factor in that. Next slide, please. We talk about equity and we talk about equality and we talk about justice. And sometimes we don't really always know what some of those subtle distinctions are. In the slide that's on the screen right now, we see this whole notion of equality where we have three people who are all very different in size um, and they're all standing on a crate to look at the soccer game. But they all don't have the same vantage point even though they have an equal distribution of um, being lifted up off of the ground. The whole notion around equality has emerged and evolved over the course of time. Within the context of social justice, we want to see that people have equal access to all aspects of different parts of our, our social arena, but we're not all tall, some of us are, are small, some of us are, have a darker color hue, some of us have thick hair, some of us have thin hair. But we're all equal as human beings. But as far as the concept of equality, it just, it just doesn't necessarily um, uh, lend itself to us all having the same access. When we talk about the whole concept of equity, what we find out is that some people may need more in order for it to be more equitable. So in this particular, in the second slide, you see um, the person in the middle has one crate lifting her up in order for her to be able to see the soccer game, puts her on a, a much more equal uh, footing with the person on the left. And then the person on the right-hand side has two crates. This is what we are talking about when we, when we talk about equity, really providing uh, an opportunity for people to have more access and more opportunity. And if we just look at each other in, in the context of as we are, we, don't, we know that everyone doesn't necessarily have those same advantages. And then of the course, here's a, this last slide is justice they all have an opportunity to be able to see the soccer game, not necessarily in the same way, but either through the top of the fence. And that is something that gives them all access to the same game that they're watching. Next slide, please. We have another example here of the whole, um, the idea around equal access. You know, um, when you look at the top, um, the top part of the screen, you see someone in a wheelchair um, that the person next to them that's in a bicycle that's not really fit for them because it's too small. You see a person next to them, that bicycle seems to be just fine. And then of course, on the far right-hand side, the bicycle seems to be a larger, um, vehicle and not the quite the right fit. When we talk mm -hmm. about social justice and we talk about equity, we really give people access to what it is that they need. So um, on the lower screen, you can see that the vehicles that they have are a better fit for them in order for them to be able to enjoy and to participate on an equal footing. I um, have done um, a lot of reading um, from um, Dr. John Powell, he's an attorney, and he was previously the director of um, something called the Haas Institute, which uh, Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. And one of the things he always talks about is this whole notion around othering, how we other people, what we 
make these distinctions about who people are by putting them in a different category in a different box. And one of the things that he advocates is that we really do have to create a society where everybody belongs. And that requires a lot of intentionality. We don't always have intentionality. Things kind of happen and evolve the way they are. But really when we do this whole concept of othering, we're really not giving everybody access to the same um, opportunities. And we're in some instances denying their humanity. We have to have something um, that he describes as targeted universalism, where we acknowledge that people are different and the pathways to reach them are also going to be different. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we see the overlap between social justice and climate change and, and uh, climate justice. Social justice, some of the, the basic pr principles of equity, access, participation, and um, rights, the, the rights of an individual. And uh, everyone deserves to have the same types of rights, but we know historically in our country and in our communities that has not been the case. Many of the people, um, and ma mainly a lot of people of color, have had to shoulder and be and were burdened with a lot of the uh, lack of access and the equal opportunities in order for them to be successful in life. Uh, but we have a, 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 a an earth that is changing. Uh, climate change is changing the earth in so many ways. And to be honest with you, if you talk to people in ind indigenous communities in particular, they will tell you we have not taken good care of our of our um, of our planet. We have not taken good care of the earth. Um, we have had a different worldview when it comes to um, manufacturing and technology, and we have not taken care of our waterways. We've dumped things in the water. These are aspects of climate change that have made the difference, and many people. Um, who have been marginalized in our community are really carrying a lot of the burden of this. Um, people, people know that um, people of color in particular, um, I've, I've seen some studies where it suggests that they've been really um, knowledgeable about climate change and really are that because people have so many traumatic issues that they deal with on a regular and daily basis, that it's sometimes really hard to concentrate on something that seems as novel as, as climate change. But we have to really make sure that people know, they understand and appreciate. The fact that we are having all of these fires on the West Coast, the fact that we're having so much flooding here in the uh, mid, mid, Midwest, as well as on the East Coast, those things are not happenstance. Those are things that we are doing that are impacting our, uh, our planet. And so we just really have to teach ourselves and learn more about the importance and the value of climate change, social justice, and how those inter interconnect. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanna close, I wanna close out saying, um, we, in many instances, are disconnected from our environment. And we're, of course, disconnected from each other. Um, we have to really shift our mindset and really not only take care of each other, but take care of our planet. A deconstruction of the negative ways of being it has impacted our planet. And we cannot allow some of the negative things that we have learned along the way to continue. We have got to make a change. We have got to make a shift in order to make and build a very healthy society and healthy communities. I would assert that we need to be advocates for social justice within the realm of climate and with all of the, within the realm of all of the infrastructures because one of them, all of them build upon each other. And it's the only way that we're going to be able to survive and save our planet. And so I'd like to turn it over to Rob, who's gonna give us some um, suggestions about what we can do here in the Tosa community um, about climate change and how to be better advocates. 
Thank you, Celia. It was a, a really, uh, really nice segue from what Jennifer was talking about, which is that the impacts are happening. They're getting progressively more severe. And that um, through historical inequities, those things are, are gonna be exacerbated by continuing climate change unless we are deliberate about how we go about mitigating and learning to live with some of the changes that are already baked into the climate system. So, um, and I think that what's been really uh, encouraging for me to see uh, with the Milwaukee City County uh, Climate and Economic Equity Plan is that these two issues are, are seen as very much intertwined. And that as we think about what is the transition that has to happen for Milwaukee, the greater Milwaukee area, Wisconsin, our country and our world to become truly environmentally sustainable, to slow the growth of temperature rise and flooding and things like this. Uh, it's a, it's going to take decades to do this. It's a huge, it's probably the biggest undertaking that humanity's ever had to go through, but we all need to do our part. And I think that, that um, it's been encouraging to see that Milwaukee and, and here in Wauwatosa too, we're part of Milwaukee County, are looking to do our part, to think about what does this mean for us as a community? What are the opportunities for us as we look around, around how we expect things to change? How do we use this impetus to make things better? And I've seen that throughout all of the work groups that are, are going on with the, with the uh, climate and equity plan is this idea that we do have challenges in front of us. We do have things that need to be addressed in our community. We have, uh, there's things that are fundamentally unfair in our community, but this is an opportunity for us to, to address some of those things and make them better, not make them worse. So um, we have had um, uh, these, these uh, work groups that have been going on, uh, the, the, the climate equity, plan was really launched in late 2019 and then throughout 2020 uh, brought together uh, through these work groups that are, are continuing now and working into 2021. Um, what's going to come out of this is a, is a plan with recommendations for specific projects um, that can be funded in, at the city and county level that will address certain aspects that the, that the uh, uh, early research identified as, as key opportunities for us. We do want um, citizens to engage with this. And so you see a link down here, uh, the Engage MKE link. Um, you can comment on the plan as it stands right now, things that you think are important, maybe things that you think are missing. Um, so we would encourage you, one of the first things you could do is make your voice heard on this by um, using that URL and, and following up, filling out the survey and, and giving us some feedback on what you think, uh, how you think this looks. You wanna move the slide? So one of the things to, when I mean, you're gonna do a plan, you sort of have to do a, a current status, you know, where are we at? Um, and so uh, this consulting firm, ICLEI, works with local governments around the world um, and has, uh, has some methodology for understanding how much greenhouse gas do we emit as a community. And so they did a study, uh, they were commissioned to do a study at the city of Milwaukee, and they have come up with estimates of how much, how many metric tons of greenhouse gas are emitted per year and by what sector, which I think is very interesting. Um, and this differs slightly from what the U.S. average is because Milwaukee is different than, than, the, than the national average. But you see that uh, the biggest piece of the pie here is residential energy use, particularly home heating and, and electricity. And uh, with transportation being the second, second biggest piece and uh, commercial and industrial also uh, becoming part of that. So what that helps us understand is where should we focus? And um, you'll see that there is a, if you think about residential, obviously that could be single family, multifamily housing, 
but there's also uh, in the commercial sector, uh, commercial building operations. And so you'll see it, that there's a focus on building energy efficiency and electrification, as well as um, transportation issues. That's, that's addressing most of what we're, we're looking at. So the big ideas that came out of that ICLA survey really uh, were these identified as these 10 things, and we've got them bucketed into actually seven areas here. Um, the uh, building residential efficiency. So think of that in terms of uh, upgrading the insulation in your home or your furnace um, or your lighting in your home to reduce the amount of, of energy that you need. That's either electricity that's produced by burning fossil fuels here in Southeast Wisconsin or natural gas heating or, or water heating. So the first thing you should do is just try to use less. Um, and so the, one of the big ideas will be helping particularly low-income families um, figure out how to finance this kind of work or, or uh, landlords to do that for their, for their buildings. Um, if we're building new, let's build the most efficient buildings we can. Uh, there's a saying in the, in the uh, building sector that uh, if you build to code, you're building the worst possible building you can legally build. And so we recognize that um, as we build new buildings, again, even here in Wauwatosa, why are we building buildings that aren't as efficient as they should be uh, or could be? Those buildings are going to be around for the next 50 to 100 years. Let's, let's do the right thing and build them as efficiently. Ask those builders who are giving tax incremental financing to, to do these kind of things better. And then finally, the commercial building standards. Uh, the building standards are set at the state level, but we certainly would want to encourage um, uh, more of more energy efficient, uh, even net zero energy, net zero carbon buildings uh, to be built whenever possible. I'm sure many of you have heard a lot about electric vehicles. Um, the EV craze is certainly a big time in California. It's coming to Wisconsin, it's not quite here yet. Uh, we recognize that's an important part of it, but we wanna enable the, um, the infrastructure that's needed, the charging stations, things like that that are needed to make adoption of um, electric vehicles a lot easier. Um, but really, we also want to reduce the amount of vehicle miles we're driven by making communities more walkable, more bikeable, um, so that you don't necessarily need to buy a $30,000 or $40,000 electric car to take advantage of this. You can hop on your bike or walk to where most everywhere you need to go. So reduce the amount of vehicle, vehicle travel. One of the biggest things that's gonna happen here in Wisconsin and across the country is the, is the um, greening of the grid. So you, there's already a, a massive movement to renewable energy generation, both wind and solar, that's displacing coal and eventually will displace natural gas. A big part of President Biden's um, green energy uh, incentives still being debated in Congress is to accelerate that. And we certainly think that that's an important part of it. Uh, we Energies, our, our utility here in Southeast Wisconsin uh, has already committed uh, to a significant, I believe they've already committed to net zero by 2050, net zero greenhouse gas to generate the electricity that we're gonna need. Another aspect is nature in the city. So uh, Celia mentioned how important connecting back to nature and green spaces. We also talked, we heard from, from Jennifer how important a good tree canopy is uh, to mitigate the heat and during heat waves. And so th there's a, a focus area on this. The city of Milwaukee's done a lot. We're blessed in Wauwatosa to have very, uh, a lot of green space here in the city. Um, but we are looking to make sure that, that there's access to all residents uh, to be, have green space that's walkable. Food waste reduction is one of the groups that I'm working on, and that is um, when you waste food, you're not only wasting the energy and the water it took to grow it, you're wasting the money that was spent to make it, and you're putting it in a landfill typically where it will sit over time and degrade to methane, which is in a very potent greenhouse gas. So what we really wanna do is reduce the amount of waste in the first place and then make sure that that which we can't reduce like scraps don't get in the landfill that, they, that there's a way to, 
compost them or otherwise divert them from the landfill. We've heard a lot about infrastructure uh, at the federal level and here in Wisconsin. Um, somebody's got to do all that work. And as we look for opportunities um, to green the grid, to uh, make homes more energy efficient, uh, we, it's a skilled trade uh, opportunity for thousands and thousands of Wisconsin workers and, and youth who may not have an opportunity. These are good paying jobs. They're local and they're sustainable. And so having an accelerator that works with the, the tech schools and the high schools to make sure that, that we're allowing youth and encouraging youth to get into these fields is certainly a key role to play. And then finally, uh, what's called resilience ambassadors. Um, you know, Jennifer talked about some of these things that are going on. And if we could wave a magic wand today and stop emitting all greenhouse gases, we'd still have a temperature rise that's gonna happen because of the emissions that have already occurred. We need to have a way to make sure that people can survive the next you know, 20, 30 years, that when we do have heat waves, that they have access to the information that they need, uh, places to cool down, uh, they know how to take care of themselves. So I think it's really important that we, uh, we think about uh, resilience is how, how do we as a society adapt in the short term and, and helping people do that. Jennifer, you wanna move the slide? So here in Wauwatosa, I as mentioned in the introductions, I'm a member of the Wauwatosa Sustainability Committee and the committee has been around uh, helping the city with the city operations for uh, over 10 years uh, on, on their energy and recycling efforts. Um, we are really happy that, that the, the council passed the resolution last October uh, committing the city to um, reduce its carbon emissions to zero by 2050. And the city's doing a lot on their own operations. We have uh, uh, a major uh, PV solar installation over at the, the, uh, by the police station. And then this spring uh, covered the roof of City Hall and the library with PV uh, cells that are generating electricity that's running the library and City Hall on 100% on clean energy. So there's those kind of projects, but we're really just getting started in the community. And these are things that the city is doing, but most of our footprint, if we say we're similar to Milwaukee's, is coming at the residential sector. And what we're looking to do going forward is helping Wauwatosa residents, uh, property owners, small businesses become part of the plan, part of the solution, helping them save money, reduce their, uh, their emissions that they, that they use from using energy and uh, um, generally helping Wauwatosa become a better place to live and work uh, in the coming years. Advance it. Thanks, Rob. Really appreciate that overview. It was really helpful and informative. So I want to kind of wrap up by talking a little bit about what we can do um, personally. When we were talking about this um, conversation, um, I was mentioning to Rob how frustrated I get when I hear news reports and they tell me about one more terrible thing that's happening and I just wanna yell at the screen and say, well, what am I supposed to do about it? What can I do? Um, and when I first learned about the climate crisis, I really felt overwhelmed and not a little depressed. I mean, honestly, and it doesn't help that we're facing so many other problems right now, many of which stem from the same systems that created climate change in the first place. When we feel, um, you know, I don't know about you, but when I hear about one more problem or another social injustice, it's really easy to feel powerless and frustrated, is really tempted just to zone out and distract ourselves. But this is an all hands on deck situation. We really need everyone to do what they can. From my experience, as um, I've gone through life, I found that it is often helpful to start with thinking about where I do have some control. So in preparing for our talk tonight, I thought about our actions as taking place in kind of a widening circle of influence and control. 
all of which are mutually reinforcing. And that first inner circle is really important. It includes two kinds of awareness. First, we can have an open mind and be willing to learn more about the climate crisis and what we can do about it. Sometimes it's hard to read this information and learn about it, but it's important. Second, we can maintain an awareness of our own needs and what we need to do to avoid cynicism and despair. This may include allowing ourselves time to grieve for the world that we've lost. I have found that there are some really wonderful resources out there. This is just three examples um, that help me have helped me stay informed and grounded. Uh, Jaren's book particularly illuminates the historic link between our human inventiveness and our current planetary predicament. She talks about the different inventions that people have made to solve a problem, but now they created a new problem. <laughs> so we don't need to feel guilty for being born into a system that was set up this way. But now that we see the unintended consequences of some previous human decisions, we can take action. This graphic from the Institute of Physics illustrates that second circle of personal action. There are things we can do to decrease our carbon footprint. And many of us are making decisions about our consumption and living habits. As we can see in the choices laid out here, our actions can have varying degrees of impact. Obviously changing light bulbs in your house is gonna have a much less impact than changing your diet. Um, I can do more now as a retired person than I could do as a working mother. So naturally my choices will reflect my circumstances and it's the same for you. I found, especially as a mom, it was really helpful to start small and to build from there. For example, reducing food waste as Rob has mentioned um, and also eating a much uh, more plant-based diet can actually have an impact. I recently learned that we waste 40% of the food we produce. That's like going to the grocery store, buying five bags of groceries, and then just throwing two of them in the, in the garbage right away. I was really appalled when I learned that. And I realized that I too have been guilty of, of not um, making the best use of the food in my home. So reducing that waste um, will decrease greenhouse gas emissions from landfills and it will have ripple effects because as Rob pointed out, wasting less food means we will need to convert fewer areas um, into farmland. Another very important area that we can have an impact on is transportation. As we saw earlier, transportation is a major contributor to the climate crisis. I learned recently that for every gallon of gas we burn, we emit 20 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I think of that every time I have to get into my car. So going car less, that is to say not having a car, or at least driving less, will be one of the biggest impacts that we can make. Um, and so when we walk, bike, or take the bus instead of driving, we're helping the environment. But, and finally, there's that outer circle. While we need everyone to do what they can to reduce emissions in their daily lives, we need to address the systems fueling climate change. These systems are controlling our choices. For an example, we know from multiple studies that more people would really like to take the bus to work or, or drive their, their bike, but they can't because our transit system is adequate or they don't feel safe biking. We can fix that but it takes leverage. And that is best accomplished by working with others. Leah Cardamon Stokes has pointed out in a recent article, no one can unilaterally choose to live in a low carbon economy. The goal is not self purification, but structural change. Put simply, we cannot make enough headway on the climate problem by working at it at the individual level. And the funny thing is when we work with other people, we start to feel encouraged and have a greater sense of um, agency on our own. These are just some of the organizations that are doing good work in our communities. Um, I encourage you to learn more about them and particularly as Rob pointed out to um, take advantage of opportunities to 
give input on the city county task force and their and the TOSA sustainability committee. Um, these are just a few of the opportunities available to you to help um, get connected to other people and work in community. I'd like to end by reading something that I recently saw in one of the um, essays from um, one of the books that I just mentioned. Um, Emily Johnston has pointed out the need and the opportunity of addressing climate change. She says, the world needs you and it needs you right now because anything that we can do this year or next is worth 10 of the same thing 10 years from now. We have also been granted an astonishingly beautiful gift that has never before been granted to humans. The chance to shepherd human and animal life into the coming centuries. That's a power that should make us very humble and a privilege that can motivate us profoundly. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Celia. That's uh, a lot of good information there. And we have a lot of questions, uh, but only about 10 more minutes. So I am going to start with Rob as a TOSA resident. Uh, so we have a question. How would a climate plan for Milwaukee look for TOSA or other suburbs? What are the overlaps and differences? Yeah, I, I like the question because um, even as you know, we're a different city than Milwaukee, we share a lot of, of boundary with them and a lot of people move uh, between the two cities and through Wauwatosa if they're going from Milwaukee out to Brookfield or vice versa. And um, so I think ideally uh, a sustainability plan in Wauwatosa will dovetail uh, with Milwaukee's on issues that are of shared uh, interest, like transportation and uh, like access to green space that, you know, people who live in Milwaukee just a, across the city line from Wauwatosa should be able to access green spaces in Wauwatosa or vice versa. So I think that there, and, and, and then a lot of the resources and, and I would call it the technical background that's involved with understanding the city's carbon footprint, um, working with um, industry and business and um, developers on thinking about how are they going to develop. Again, shouldn't really be different in Wauwatosa than Milwaukee, than West Allis or um, you know, Greenfield or wherever. I think that there's, there's things that lend themselves to a regional approach but there's things that we can control here in the city. So a good sustainability plan, I think, um, regionalizes those things that need to be, but has local control of things like uh, how we work with our small businesses, how we support our residents, our, our, um, our uh, renters here in Wauwatosa, our seniors here in Wauwatosa, and how do we um, recognize that um, whatever we change here in Wauwatosa has to be done in a way that improves equity, that doesn't kind of bake in the, the structural inequality and, and racism that's been you know, in our systems for, for decades. We've just, we have an opportunity to change things, so let's change them for the better. Thank you, Rob. Celia, I have a question. It says, how can addressing climate change in Milwaukee County also lift up the most vulnerable? Well, uh, it, first of all, it helps people understand that some of the connections that there are between climate change and um, certain populations in Milwaukee. Uh, people don't necessarily always make the connection of some of the, the, the mental health issues or the just physical health issues that they're impacted and how the climate plays a role in that. So becoming more informed. Well, okay. Thank you. You froze for a little bit. Oh, did yeah. I? I'm sorry. I know I said unstable, and so I'm oh, not sure you heard all of what I said. I apologize. 
That's I, think got, I think we got most of it. I would like to, to piggyback on what Celia is saying. Um, in addition to reducing the effects of climate change, um, by switching to a green economy, there's wonderful opportunities for us to create new green jobs. And it's really important that we target those jobs to um, people who have been economically disadvantaged in the past, that we provide training and access to those jobs. Many people are not aware that green jobs provide five times as many. If you have, for example, you look at um, something like building a new highway, that's um, not a green job. It creates a one-time job. But if you're a bus driver, that's a, that's a career. That's something that can keep you going for a long time and provide you with benefits. So green jobs tend to be better paying, um, usually about 18% higher. Um, they usually have better um, career paths and they're more, uh, there's more variety. Okay. And fewer requirements for education too. Okay. I have other questions, but let me just say this. None of this happens without intentionality. I mean, I know that a lot of times people have really good intentions, but it really, it, it really does require being in action to make these things happen. We can't just do it kind of on an intellectual level. We have to really be engaged on an actual level. And I, you know, I really appreciate what you said, Jennifer, because I don't think most people look at a, a bus driver job as, um, as a green job. But we really do not only have to change our mindset, we have to educate ourselves in a whole new world uh, worldview of how we're going to be able to survive on this planet. And I don't think that we do that. We're kind of stuck in an old way and a particular way of how things have been done. And it has not been serving us well as far as our environment. Thank you. So we can segue to transportation. We have a few questions about transportation, but buses, there's a, a concern that buses that go through TOSA cannot get people to where they want to go. So I know both of you are in the transportation committee. Have you talked about buses through the county, throughout the county? Rob, maybe, um, well, Celia, I don't know that we've talked about it through the county and I'm a little fuzzy because I haven't looked at it lately, but we're looking at numerous um, ways of expanding not only the bus routes, but the, the biking lane, uh, trails. Um, I know that there are plans to uh, create um, what they call it, bus rapid transit lines um, and, co and connect the entire city. There's plans, uh, so yeah. Um, I can't be more specific, sorry about that, but I do know that I, if I did my homework properly, I should be able to give you more specifics, but we, the plan from Milwaukee does look at how we can connect across the county better. Okay, thank you. Um, Rob, how can we support regional collaboration to solve climate issues in this area? Well, I think that the, you know, it was, that was really one of the charges of the, of the city county task force was to look at it, um, at least on Milwaukee County scale. Um, what we're seeing is that there's states, there's cities all over the state that are doing similar work, uh, Madison and Dane County, Green Bay, Eau Claire, um, you know, and certainly Chicago and the Chicago metro area has, has a whole push on sustainability and you know, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that it's a lot of this is um, understanding, you know, who's, who else is working on this and who are, who are in similar situations than us. The other thing I think is really important, we haven't really talked about it yet, is the, is the politics of all of this. And I, it, it's unfortunate that this issue got so politicized over the last 30 years because I think everybody wants to live in a better world, a fairer world, a cleaner world. And, you know, we may have differences of opinion about how to get there, but there are, there's clearly uh, a need for regional collaboration, not just in Milwaukee County, but with Waukesha, um, Ozaki, Washington, Racine County. Um, and, and I think that, I know that there are people on both sides of the political aisle that, that 
care about this issue. And so I think it's going to take some leadership to, to bridge those, those gaps and work together. And, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, if you're a citizen, you need to, you need to be pressing on your elected officials to say, this is, this is a problem. And I support that, you know, these, these kind of solutions and I'm going to vote my, my conscience on this. Thank you. Well, our time is coming to an end. So if each of you would please take one minute to, I don't know, either summarize or give your parting message of your charge to our audience. So um, Celia, I'll start with you. Jennifer, maybe I'll start with you. I think she's frozen again. <laughs> oh, okay. Go ahead, Thanks. Celia. Oh, um, am I frozen? Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can, can hear you. Well, I was just, I was saying, as long as we continue to do what we do, it's not going to, it's not going to change. Um, we have to be willing to make some sacrifices. We have to be willing to step outside of our comfort zone. We have to be willing to give up some of the luxuries and pleasures that we have come to enjoy in order for the greater good to survive. Otherwise, we're all going to be compromised because our planet really needs our attention and we just need to make that mind shift in a very intentional way not just speaking about it but thank you jennifer i i don't think i can top that that is just a wonderful summary of what we've been talking about tonight and that was one of the reasons I'm so glad that Sally can be here with us tonight because she has so much insight into this. Thank you. Rob? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, even as we're facing a, a changing world with, with all sorts of challenges, um, there has to be a, a positive vision about what's possible. I mean, I think that, you know, when we're at our best, we're, we're working together to make make our community better, to make it fairer, to make it safer, um, and, and provide more economic opportunity for everyone. And, 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 and this transition to a more sustainable world, a more equitable world, um, can be that. Uh, but as, as, as Celia said, there has to be an intentionality about it. You can't just kind of hope that development patterns sort of fix themselves. I mean, these decisions are human decisions, there are leadership decisions, government decisions. There are also our personal decisions that we're making in our, you know, our individual lives and, and with our friends and family. So um, yeah, there has to be some intentionality about it. There has to be some learning that has to occur. And I think that as we think about sustainability in Wauwatosa, we recognize that all of those things are, uh, you know, we can help lead them as a committee but we really do need our elected officials, our schools, um, and, and civic leaders and, and civic organizations to be part of it, to voice their opinions about it, to be part of creating it and part of executing it. So I, I, this, is a, this is an all hands on deck thing. It has to be. Thank you. I hope all our viewers will join me in thanking our guests from the Milwaukee City County Task Force on Climate and Economic Equity, Rob, Celia and Jennifer, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking time to talk with us tonight and for sharing all your great information, experiences, and insights. And we also want to thank you all, our viewers, <laughs> and thank you for bearing with us with our technology snafu. But thank you for your time and your interest in tonight's discussion. And as always, a special thank you to our generous friends at Bostic, whose support makes the entire Tosa Talk series possible. Remember, you can find a recording of tonight's presentation and all Tosa Talks presentations on the Tosa Together YouTube channel. Please feel to reach out to Tosa Together anytime through our Facebook page, our website, or by emailing us directly at tosatogether at gmail.com. This is Catherine Reby with Tosa Together, and it has been my pleasure to be here with our special guests, as well as with all of you. Thank you for being part of Tosa Talks and our mutual effort to build a diverse, thriving community. Good night.